Uh, welcome all of you this evening. You're in for a great treat, I believe. We got two great uh, young people that are okay. been working real hard for the last few months. And uh, come on in, Nancy, and welcome y'all. Um, I want you to, to meet Megan, Megan Alley. Uh, you got to stand up, Megan. Uh, she's tall enough to put the light bulbs in for me. It's been really, she's really been wonderful. These are two great. Uh, young people that are from Rice, Rice graduates. Anybody's from Rice is impressed already, and I am too. Uh, Stuart Nelson and Megan Alley. And Megan has been on our staff as a project manager. She will share with you the physician um, survey results in just a few minutes. And first, we're going to be with, begin with Stuart Nelson. And Stuart is uh, can introduce himself if he will, but. Um, as you've already heard, he's a graduate of Rice, and he is going into religious studies to get his master's degree in Santa Barbara, California. It's a real hard assignment, <laughs> and we're, we're going to visit him regularly. <laughs> it's really great. He's, in fact, uh, uh, we're really excited for him, and uh, so you're, you have time. Make your presentation, if you will. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, this is on, Dr. Graham, but I don't know if it's doing that much. That's not on. I'm not sure it's on. I'm not sure it's on. It was. John was definitely on. It was. Hold this. Yeah. That's on. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Turn this off. I'm sorry. This Please do. You're just the only a problem. Loud. Is, <laughs> problem is, I can't figure out how to turn this one off. Okay. Uh, so, okay, that's good. That's good. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate y'all all, all coming out. Um, so, my name is Stuart Nelson, uh, and today I'll be talking about um, one uh, relationship or one perspective that we could take on uh, the interface between religion and health. Um, it's a little bit unique, so please bear with me. Um, I, I, uh, I look forward to hearing your questions at the end, so. Uh, uh, if you have any, please don't hesitate to ask them. And also, this could be a good dialogue too, so if you feel like saying something in the middle, just jump in and that'll be great. You know, it'll be a good forum. For yes? Can you just explain a little bit what you majored in? I mean, I read what well, Dr. Graham said. It's out. interesting that you asked. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Has that been up there? No, no. Oh, I just, I just, oh you just got Yeah, you asked and I uh, gave the an answer. So, great. Um, I just graduated from Rice University in May. Um, I did three majors there, uh, all bachelors of arts. Um, I did uh, cognitive science, religious studies, and psychology. Um, the beginning of my undergraduate career was mostly focused on cognitive science, uh, which, um, for those of you, you that don't know, takes a neural perspective um, at uh, consciousness and uh, tries to understand psychology from a couple different, um, human psychology from a couple different perspectives. Uh, including the neuroscientific ones, sort of all the money in cognitive sciences and neuroscience. Uh, and then I was more broadly interested in psychology, so I took enough classes um, to major there. And then I took a class my freshman year, and the second half of my undergraduate experience was mainly focused on religious studies, and namely the psychology of religion. So trying to understand why people believe what they believe, how different belief systems um, arise, and uh, sort of uh, a lot about what we'll be hearing about today. Um, on Monday, I'm getting on a plane and going out to Santa Barbara, and there I'll be doing a one-year master's program in religious studies under the guidance of a woman named Ann Taves, who uses uh, cognitive methods to understand how um, religious systems are built. So uh, taking individual experiences um, and individuals' belief systems and uh, understanding how those aggregate into the larger world religions that we see uh, around us, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and all of those. What, what is it about um, these powerful experiences that you and I have day to day that make us uh, feel the need to become a member of a religious tradition? Um, I'm more, most broadly interested in bridging sciences and humanities. I thought it's such a shame during my time at Rice that uh, we have this beautiful academic quad and on one half we have the humanities and on the other half we have the engineers. 
and there's very, very little uh, correspondence between them. You know, you don't see a lot of people walking across, and that's just a shame. You know, they're they're brilliant people on both sides of the quad, and uh, I think that um, in more cases than not, uh, you know, sort of like two heads are better than one, and uh, these these empirically minded people and these more um, uh, creative minded people can uh, come together, I think, and, and do some pretty cool stuff. So I think we'll see some of that today, um, and certainly in a lot of the talks here at ISH, that, that's evident. So this summer, um, specifically, I came, I sent an email to Dr. Graham asking him if there was a place for me here. I, I was trolling the website, and, and I became interested in what's going on at ISH. I didn't know a lot about it. And, he said, yes, like what a pleasant surprise. We would love for you to come and spend the summer here and we'll try to see if um, there's something that you can do here. And so uh, it, was, it was just that link between sciences and humanities that ISH seems to endorse that, that brought me here um, in the beginning. Uh, and it also has to do with my future goals. I, 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 wanna, um, I wanna eventually open a psychotherapeutic practice and help people um, who are struggling with religious issues come to terms with those issues. And I'm also interested in using religion, the category of religion, as a therapeutic tool itself. So uh, in, in psychology we talk about schemas. So schemas are these sort of mental structures that, that we, we might all have uh, and that allow us to do things in the world um, more easily. And religion could be seen as a schema. You know, it gives us a way of thinking about the world to where we don't have to think all the time about what we're doing every second of the day. We'll, if we have religious beliefs, then this sort of helps us through the world in, in an easy way. And I think that's very valuable, and it has therapeutic import. Um, thirdly, uh, I, I, I became familiar once I was here with a book called The Handbook of Religion and Health, HRH, by a guy named Dr. Conan. It was published in 2001, and it served as the basis to a lot of the studies um, that, I, uh, that I embarked on this summer. And I was reading it, and I thought, well, you know, this, this is really great material, but the layperson is never going to have access to this. You know, this is really, really esoteric, like, you know, thick scientific language. So, you know, how might we be able to bring this same information into the wider public into a way that the general, general public can understand, um, which would help, I think, uh, promote a really important message, and that is that religion and healthcare do have a lot to do with each other. And uh, finally, uh, another reason why these studies this summer have been really important is because of my personal experience. I was raised overseas in a very multicultural environment, and uh, I took a lot of courses at Rice that allowed me to see um, sort of the diversity of faith opinions, and, uh, and I think that, um, that religion, religion has a lot to do with our psychology, it has a lot to do with healthcare, it has a lot to do with everything, simply because um, as, as we'll see in a second, I think everybody is religious, even if they're an atheist. So uh, this is the cover of the book, A Handbook of Religion and Health. Um, uh, we also used um, journal articles for online peer-reviewed journals, and some books from both the academic and popular press. So we used, we used stuff from all over the place uh, to form the opinions uh, that we're about to present, or I'm about to present. Um, it was, it was a wide range of literature. So to begin, sort of this is the first slide of the presentation itself after all the buildup. Um, first, we're going to try to understand what we mean by this, by this assumption that this entire presentation is grounded on. Humans are spiritual beings. Humans are spiritual beings is, is, a, uh, is a given for me. Um, I think that uh, this, this, this phrase has truth. And um, I guess it's arguable, but this is a premise that we're going to have to accept. And so I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that. Humans, all humans are, are, are spiritual beings. Second, we're going to need to define spirituality for everyone so that we're operating under the same definition. And likewise, uh, we're going to define religion in a bit of a unique way based on our definition of spirituality. And I think uh, it has, um, it has uh, uh, importance or it has pertinence to a wide range of religious traditions and religious faiths, um, most maybe uh, importantly in this room, uh, the Christian faith. Um, finally, we're going to identify some practices that are cited in the health literature that um, are both correlated with positive health outcomes and that are endorsed across the major traditions. 
So I'm not going to say too much about that right now because that's kind of what the entire thing is about. So humans are spiritual being, beings. What do we mean by that? Well, we, we, we start, um, Carl Jung uh, began uh, one of his most, I mean, one of his most fundamental principles in his whole psychology is that the human psyche is religious by nature. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that um, in the words of one of my professors at Rice, we're all engaging on this, on this sort of religious quest for a complex subjectivity. And that means uh, that we're all engaged on this quest to answer the big questions, whether we know it or not. We're, we're on the quest to answer why are we here, who are we here, when are we here, what are we here, and why are we here. Uh, all of these big questions um, that, that people, I think, uh, at one point in their life are confronted with and our capacity to ask those questions is what makes us spiritual. Our capacity to answer them and our efforts to answer them, that's what makes humans spiritual. Uh, the answering of these big questions. So, in other words, um, as Harold, uh, J. Harold Ellen said it in his, in his series called The Healing Power of Spirituality, it's a three volume series, he, he put it really beautifully, I think, it says, Spirituality is the universal hunger of the human spirit for meaning. We're all embarked on a quest for meaning in one way or another. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that both those who are in the sciences and those in the humanities are, get, are engaged in this quest for meaning no matter what. Um, so humans are spiritual creatures. So religion then, uh, as we're going to talk about it today, and you have to understand that religion is, the definition of religion has been contested forever, you know, I mean, how are we going to define religion? This is an impossible thing. But for the, pr the purposes of today, we're going to define religion as that spirituality, the sense about those big questions embodied in the world. So it's your, it's your thoughts and sort of your spirituality embodied in your religion. So when you go to church or you go to the mosque or the temple, you are doing something in the world, embodied physically in the world, that is promoting your idea of spirituality. You're doing something that, uh, that is furthering your idea of the, what those answers to those big questions are. So um, in the same way, a scientist, you know, a hardcore materialist scientist says he's an atheist, has no religious beliefs at all, goes into his office to, uh, you know, one day this physicist, and he says, well, Today I'm going to try to, you know, further this project to find this fundamental formula that will describe everything, right? This is sort of this truth at the capital, uh, with a capital T at the end of the line that the scientist is pursuing. Well, that's a form of, that's a form of, of religious, that's a religious quest he's on, he's embarking on that, that person, he or she is embarking on this, this quest to find meaning. It's this religious quest. So we're going to try to, we're going to try to, to, to look at religion rather than um, a specific faith uh, as, as more of this embodied quest um, to, to promote our spirituality. So a good way to think about it is spirituality is sort of the biggest thing uh, and what defines us all. Then inside that circle we have religion. Um, that's, you know, crossing from the big circle into the little circle makes, that's that embodiment. That's taking our mental thoughts about what's you know, that's taking our spirituality and putting it into practice in the world. And within religion, you have Islam, atheism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Baha'ism, uh, Judaism. You have all of these different religions that are expressed as religion. Um, and people can occupy different spaces within that. You know, you could imagine, uh, you could imagine another circle that maybe intersects Buddhism and Christianity. So someone who um, endorses both the practices of, of Christianity and Buddhism. Yes, there are differences, but people have found ways to navigate those spaces. Likewise, some, someone may find themselves placed on this little map, not inside any of those big circles, but they say they're religious. What religion are you part of? Well, I don't know. I just know I'm religious, right? So religion, rather than being confined to these faith systems, these faith traditions, can be seen as just a way of expressing your spirituality in the world, a physical embodiment of your spiritual spirituality. Is everybody is everybody okay with that? That's a that's a big thought, and, and it's very it's a very strange way of looking at it. I realize, yeah. When a person says that I'm spiritual, are they really saying I'm religious? I, I would argue yes. I would say yes. I would say spirituality and religion are 
everybody is spiritual and therefore everybody is religious because everybody is a physical person in the world. So we're all spiritual because we're all engaged on this quest for meaning and because we're all physical bodies, we're engaging in the world and therefore we're promoting our individual religions. When someone says they're spiritual, they are saying they're religious. But I think the reason why it's difficult to understand is because religion, the word religion, is very charged. It's a very, very, very charged word. It has, it has a lot of, of baggage with it, you know? You think of religion and all of a sudden you think of my religious beliefs and how they're different from your religious beliefs and, you know, all of this. But religion is spirituality in the world. And that's, that's what we're going to, that's how we're going to talk about it today. Any more questions about that? This is sort of the the most important point, and this is the biggest thing that I'm trying to get across today. I used to think religion was man-made, uh -huh. and spirituality was of God. And just lightly, I've begun to can you Can you repeat that so we... Yeah, so she said she, she used to think that um, religion was man-made, and spirituality was of God, and then recently... Then I've become... I don't know. I just... I'm not so defined. Right. So, 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 right. You're you're struggling with this, with this, with this thought. You know, where does this, um, the spirituality end and the religion begin? And and today we're we're seeing that the spirituality is everywhere and the religion begins right once you're born. Right. Right. Once you start acting in the world. Um, another another really good example to think about this. And and I've been talking for a while now. And we're just getting started. But I think that this is a you know this is a good clarifying point. You know, Dr. Graham, who is your fellow, um, who, who, who's sort of of equal status with you at, at St. Martin's? Who, who is your fellow rector? His name? Mm -hmm. Russ Levinson. Okay, so Russ Levinson. So would you say that you and Russ Levinson have the exact same Christianity? Probably not. <laughs> okay, so you're both part of St. Martin's Church. You're both within the same religious organization, but your religions are different. You have these individual, personalized religions within that big blanket religion. And, I mean, on this you could see that as Dr. Graham is one point in that little, you know, the circle with the C representing Christianity, and uh, Dr. Levinson as another point. They're both under St. Martin's, they both believe generally the same things, but their religions do differ. So that's, a, that's another way of saying that everybody is religious in their own way, even if you exist outside of one of those, one of those circles. Um, which. A lot of people, I don't think, really realize a lot, and I think it's an important one for the reasons we're about to talk about. So, coming out of that, there's, there's several different practices that religions endorse, the major world religions, the, you know, the big five, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and uh, Buddhism, um, that have been shown to have concrete health effects. Um, and. Uh, this is a growing field, and a lot of the results are very preliminary, but um, I'm going to talk about how these practices um, that are endorsed by religious traditions have ties to health. And the trick is to see that these practices, they don't have anything to do, they don't have anything to do with each specific religion. They don't have anything to do with Christianity specifically, or Hinduism specifically, or Buddhism specifically. They have to do with religion as we're defining it. Religion as this way of operating in the world. Religion as this embodied action uh, in the world. Um, they have to do with embodied spirituality, which is our definition of religion. So we're going to talk about contemplative practice, uh, which includes meditation and prayer. Um, we're going to talk about gratitude, community involvement, altruism, hope, forgiveness, and self-expression. All those things that have consistently been seen throughout the history of the major world religions and also have distinct ties to health. There are others. Certainly there are others. Uh, you could talk about love being, being one of these practices. Awe, compassion, worship, transcendence. All of these could be seen as practices. Um, uh, but I've chosen to focus on those seven. Um, and a lot of times these ones are a little bit harder to measure. How are you going to measure love? It's easy to, rem to, to measure um, community involvement. It's hard to measure love. It's easy to measure um, sort of how hopeful someone is, but it's difficult to measure love. It's, uh, love is very slippery. Um, compassion might be uh, like hope, but anyway. Okay, so the first practice is contemplative, practi uh, contemplative practice. 
Um, so at the beginning of each practice, I'm going to give an example of, um, of it from a major world religious tradition. So for contemplative practice, we're going to take an example from Buddhism. So one of the most foundational texts of Buddhism is called the Satipatthana. And in it, the Buddha says, in this teaching, a monk lives contemplating the body in the body, ardent, clearly comprehending, and mindful, having overcome in this world covetousness and grief. He lives contemplating feelings and feelings. He lives contemplating consciousness and consciousness. And he lives contemplating mental objects and mental objects. So the, uh, the take home message there is that the, the monk uh, on his religious quest lives in contemplation. So they're endorsing a contemplative practice. Of course, contemplative practice can be seen across religious traditions. In Islam, you pray five times a day. This is most certainly a contemplative practice. In, uh, in Christianity, you know, during, um, I think, I think the, the moments while you're in communion, Holy Communion, those could be seen as a time of contemplation and deep reflection on what it means to be a Christian, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're going to start with meditation, and then we're going to talk a little bit about prayer, but not as much. So meditation is a contemplative practice. Um, it's one that's very, very, very um, broad. It's one that uh, there are a lot of different types of meditation. So that's, that's the first important thing to understand when, when reviewing the literature on, on, on health and these, these practices, is that these practices can take a lot of different forms. So in 2003, a, pub, a study was published um, at, from the University of Wisconsin, and they did something really cool. They, um, they measured alterations in your brain function based on a meditation regimen, and they found some really compelling results. They found that um, they found that uh, there were significant increases on the left side of the brain in the specific region, and uh, those specific regions uh, were associated in previous studies with um, increased positive affect. And furthermore, and I think this is the coolest part of the study, is that um, they gave they gave the meditators and the control group influenza vaccines, and then they monitored monitored their uh, antibody response and the meditators had a significantly higher antibody response to that in influenza vaccine than did the non-meditators. Meaning there was a distinct physical effect to meditation. It wasn't just mental, it wasn't just feeling good. It was a distinct immune response, uh, an increase in immune response in the, in the meditation group. And these um, studies have been replicated. They were all within significant um, bounds. Um, another really good example of a, of a meditation study um, is for older adults. They use meditation as a treatment for lower chronic, uh, uh, chronic lower back pain. And uh, this study was geared at understanding whether you could get people to, um, to adhere to a meditation regimen. And it was also geared at seeing whether it worked in an older population, because most of the studies are done in college kids. And uh, once again, they found um, significant results. People who were older, uh, they increased lower chronic back pain uh, with this uh, meditation regime. And they uh, they they had a um, they had they found that 89 percent of their their the people that they suggested the regimen to that they gave uh, or that they adhered to to the to the practice so they didn't have any problems adhering to the practice meaning it's it's a feasible thing it's it's contemplative practice I think the broad conclusion is is that contemplative practice isn't isn't difficult you know it's not. It's not something that is taxing. It's not something that takes a lot of time out of, out of your day. It, it can be done fairly easily. Um, the, the literature on prayer um, is not as extensive. And that surprises me because we're living in a country where the overwhelming amount of people are Christians. But Christian prayer does not have as extensive a, um, a, a literature base from what I could find. Maybe some of you can correct me. But... Um, but uh, yeah, there's not as extensive studies on this on the psychosomatic relationship between prayer and, and overall health. But what has been found um, is is very very convincing in the mental health um, realm. So prayer has been uh, repeatedly associated with an easier ability to cope with grief with loss. Um, it's been associated with uh, an increased ability to um, to get through. Uh, like that chronic pain is coping, another coping mechanism. 
Christianity context, uh, the studies in this context focus more on service attendance and frequency of religious attendance and sort of frequency of prayer rather than um, the, the contents of prayer. So it's a little bit harder to understand um, Christian prayer. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, one of the main areas of research for Christian prayer is uh, the, this idea of, of religious coping. You know, Ken Pargement is uh, the guy that's going to be coming here next week. And he's done a lot of work on, um, on prayer and its ability to facilitate coping through times of strife. Um, I think that uh, hospitals have realized that, um, that contemplative practice has a very big role in health because increasingly they're, they're teaching their medical students uh, in this area and they're also um, building more infrastructure for um, contemplative practice, prayer rooms and, uh, I mean, familiar with the beautiful facility, the, the chapels um, in the medical center. So uh, any questions about contemplative practice? So the second practice uh, is gratitude. Um, and gratitude is another area that as I was looking through the HRH, the Handbook of Religion and Health, I noticed that gratitude came up a lot as a reason for why religions might have a positive um, correlation with health. So. Uh, Gratitude has a lot to do with an emerging field in psychology called positive psychology. And positive psychology endorses practices such as gratitude, forgiveness, um, optimism, these kinds of things as a means towards more um, stable mental health. So um, the, the uh, example that I'm giving for gratitude from a major world religion is uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, filled with the idea of gratitude. Um, one, one, one psalm says, O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. One says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Um, you know, at church, when I go to church, and for those, for those of you who attend church regularly, you're certainly familiar with the idea of gratitude towards God. Thanks be to God is recited by worshipers frequency, frequently. Um, uh, and these are all simple but really salient examples of, of gratitude towards the divine. It's a form of gratitude. It's, it's expressing, expressing thankfulness for uh, either uh, living or um, for your uh, circumstances in life or for maybe the recent recovery from an illness or whatever. Gratitude is a very big part of religious, um, religious traditions. Um, so the first uh, article that I found very interesting um, was one called Forgiveness, Gratitude, and Well-Being, uh, The Mediating Role of Affect and Beliefs. So what these two researchers did is they, they, they recruited 72 outpatient psychiatry patients and uh, they gave them a battery of tests to measure um, several things, well-being, um, affect, uh, the capacity to forgive and express gratitude, and their beliefs. And what they found was astounding. They found really, really high correlations between all of these things. Um, and. Uh, some of the correlations were as high as 0.66, which that's from a zero to one scales, and 0.66 is, is very, very high. Um, so it's important to understand the mediating role of affect and beliefs when it comes to gratitude. So that's to say that uh, they found that both your, your affect, meaning your, um, your, your uh, sort of disposition, and your belief structures uh, both impacted the, um, your ability to uh, gain health benefits from gratitude. But more importantly and most generally they found a, a distinct correlation between the capacity to forgive and the capacity to express gratitude and uh, positive health outcomes um, in these psychiatry patients. Meaning lower rates of depression, uh, more positive affect reported, um, less uh, emotional outbreaks, and these kinds of things. I'm going to skip the next example because we're, I'm, I'm talking for a while. <coughs> Um, so the next one, uh, the next practice uh, is community involvement. And community involvement is really easy to think about as being pertinent to religion in many different ways. Uh, it's sort of the heart of organized religion. Here we see in, in what I, in my mind is one of the most impressive examples of community or just sort of gathering of people on the yearly pilgrimage uh, to Mecca in the Islam, uh, the, the, in, in the Muslim faith. It's just like a sight to behold. There's so many bodies there, um, kind of all channeling their energy towards one common goal. Um, so, for for 
social uh, for uh, for community involvement, um, I will talk about. I have sort of two examples for each, and since we're running a long time, I'm going to do just one. So, um, so the article that I'll talk about is was called "Social Support and Patient Adherence to Medical Treatment: A Meta Analysis." So, what this guy uh, uh, Robin Di Matteo from Uni University of California Riverside did is he took um, a bunch of different articles, and he, he analyzed them all and saw how social support and community involvement um, impacted people taking their medications and people recovering from illness. And uh, though the study didn't express uh, address religion specifically, um, a lot of previous studies have shown that religious involvement and your, your expression of religion have been shown to, you know, you have increased community involvement if you're religious. Generally, you express a, a greater involvement in a community because you're in a religious community. Um, so basically, uh, religion has been shown to, to, to correlate positively with family cohesiveness, social networks, marriage stability, and many other, and many other things. And he found that, um, that those family cohesiveness, social interactions, marriage stability all had a, a positive impact on health outcomes um, due to people taking their medicine. Um, and there's, I mean, there's just, there's so much literature here. Uh, for example, another researcher, Sheldon Cohen. Cohen is probably the biggest researcher in, in community involvement and in the, the sort of health and community. And he asks five basic questions. So first is what characteristics of social involvement are beneficial? Uh, and he identifies two. He says social support and social integration. So social support uh, can come in many forms. It can come in um, instrumental support, which means um, increased uh, like material support, um, donations, um, giving, giving money to those in need through a church, those kinds of things. Informational support, so those, members, or those who are members of communities, uh, uh, religious communities, have easier access to a wide range of health information. Uh, and also emotional support, and that's the most obvious one, is that when you're amongst your friends and peers and you're like-minded, you're sharing in the same embodied spirituality as them, uh, you can get emotional support for, uh, I mean, for everything, right? It, whether, you're, whether you have a, um, whether you have a, uh, uh, a chronic, you know, whether you have HIV or a cold, you know, you can get, you can get support. So the next one, uh, the next practice is altruism. And altruism, um, here it says, uh, this is a passage from the Quran that says, uh, it tells the story of Muhammad leaving with his, um, leaving exile from Mecca with all of his followers, and he gets to Medina, and all the people in Medina are really, really poor, and uh, they, they take him in. So it says, for those who were settled in Medina and adopted the faith before them, they love those who immigrated to them and found not any of their want, any want in their breasts of what the immigrants were given, but gave them preference over themselves, even though they were in privation. And whoever is protected from the stinginess of his soul, it is those who will be successful. So this is just another way of saying the golden rule, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. Uh, this is, this is, I mean, if you go out this door and look right to your right, you'll see a, a really cool poster with the golden rule expressed in many different faiths. Um, so this is altruism. Uh, so altruism in the health literature, once again, um, been shown to have positive health effects. Uh, being altruistic. So um, let's see here. So for example, one study done in 2003 looked at a population of older, older adults, and they found a strong association with being altruistic and uh, perceived well-being uh, well and life satisfaction. Um, they look at volunteers, and they see that those who volunteer more are at less risk to be depressed, uh, ha have depression. They looked at volunteers, and they see um, that those who volunteer report being happier, and uh, they have enhanced well-being. Um, Physical health of mothers who volunteered over a 30-year period. This is another study. So this is a 30-year period of volunteering, and 52% who did not belong to volunteer organization had experienced a major illness, while 36% did not uh, experience a major illness. And you know, each study on its own isn't super powerful, but when you're doing a meta study and you have 
you, you're taking into consideration the, the, the findings from like hundreds of studies and they're all pointing the same direction. It's pretty, it's pretty solid, you know, the evidence is pretty solid that, um, that things like altruism have a distinct impact on health. So the next practice uh, is hope. So uh, I thought this was a pretty prayer from Hinduism, or it's not a prayer, but it's a, uh, it's a poem uh, done by a, a Hindu writer who is sort of a renowned, he's like the most renowned Hindu poet. Uh, and he, he wrote in the fourth century. He says, listen to the salutation of the dawn, to this day for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of our existence, the bliss of growth, the splendor of beauty. For today is but a dream and tomorrow is only a vision, but today well spent makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation to the dawn. So this is an expression of hope. This is hope that the coming day will bring good things. And it ends up that, that hoping, uh, you know, optimism um, leads, leads to, uh, you know, once again, it leads to uh, increased physical and mental health. So uh, in this 2009 meta-study, 83 studies with 108 effects were included. And they found that um, there was a, a 0.17 um, correlation coefficient, which means, I mean, it's a statistical measure, so that just means that uh, there was a positive association between, a moderate positive association between those who were optimistic and those who weren't, uh, I mean, and, and, and health. Uh, so both objective and subjective measures of optimism, I mean, of well-being uh, gave results, so both um, a doctor looking at the patient and measuring um, blood pressure and uh, you know immune response and those kinds of things, as well as just the person saying, "Well, I feel better." Both of those increased um, among those who were surveyed as being optimistic. Um, so the conclusion is really simple: optimism is a significant predictor of positive physical health outcomes, and the findings show that this is especially true in cardiovascular and pain-based diseases, um, for for whatever reasons, you know. It's, it's frustrating, it's been frustrating reviewing this literature because a lot of times the mechanisms for these, these interactions are really unclear. And a lot of times the mechanisms for these interactions are correlational rather than causal, uh, meaning you don't know what's doing the affecting. So, uh, but I, I still maintain that, um, that because of the vast literature, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the findings are basically undeniable. I mean, these, these these, these practices that religions endorse and have endorsed for millennia do increase health. Um, so forgiveness, uh, we're running low. I'm, I've run for 35 minutes, so I mean, forgiveness is another practice that's been shown to increase health. Uh, creative expression is another practice that's shown to increase health. Um, forgiveness is interesting. Uh, well, cre creative expression is interesting because um, it's true for both verbal and nonverbal expression. So things like dance and painting, as well as things like journaling. And most of the literature focuses on things like writing and journaling as uh, as ways to increase increase your both your perceived physical health, your mental health, and your objectively measured physical health and mental health. Um, expression is a huge part of religious traditions. Um, Creative practices fuel culture, and that culture is aggregated religion as we defined it here. Some forms of self-expression, such as dance, have obvious health benefits simply because they involve aerobic activity. But there are some forms of self-expression that act as health buffers uh, that are not uh, that are not aerobic. Right? Uh, the most surprising of these for me was writing. There's a large number of studies that examine the link between emotional expression by writing and health. Um, a meta-analysis conducted in 2004 said that, uh, um, you know, view, uh, reviewed the links. Um, they, they, they reviewed nine studies, all which found positive uh, physical and mental health outcomes with increased, um, with increased journaling and increased writing. So the data suggests that when an individual must actively inhibit emotional expression and they bottle their emotions up, not only their mental health is impacted, but also their physical health is impacted. Um, and measures of the autonomic nervous system say the same thing. So blood pressure is, is decreased. Uh, nervous system activity is decreased. Um, a lot of times 
with people who are engaging in, in emotional expression. Uh, it's interesting to keep in mind with expression, though, that a lot of times while they're doing the expressing, uh, agitation is increased, but then afterwards it's decreased. So I guess the point there is sort of like a cathar the, the idea of like a catharsis. So, you know, you break the plate and then afterwards you feel better. <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of problems with this, um, with this, with this area. I mean, first of all, um, from a theological perspective, uh, it might nullify faith claims because thousands of personal religions have the capacity to heal. So what does that mean about the, the theological claims of the major world religions? You know, it sort of it scales them down. And I think that's a problem because it might be viewed as taking God out of the picture, something that many people are very uncomfortable with. Um, if, you, if you're speaking to a devoutly religious patient in, in the terms that I'm talking in today, they might say, well, what are you talking about? God, you know, God is what's doing it all, not these practices. Uh, so it's, it's touchy. Um, none of this is really getting at truth. None of it is really answering questions about truth or about the nature of God or anything like that. And that's another problem um, from the religious studies perspective. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, do doc doctors have time to endorse these kinds of practices in their, in their, in their practice? I mean, we already have uh, problems getting you know, all physicians to talk about diet and weight and exercise and you know, not smoking. You know, do they have time? Do they have time to be burdened with the responsibility of also providing you know, like religious care to their patients? Maybe not. And finally, there's a lot of negative correlations for health and religious belief. And I haven't analyzed those or enough or as carefully as I have the positive, um, the positive effects. And that's an admitted bias, but um, I mean, the effects are overwhelmingly positive. Uh, you know, for the for these practices that I've identified here, and I think those practices do a fairly good job of summing up what people are doing in uh, the various religious traditions. Uh, so, what do we do with this information? Um, we give it to healthcare providers in hopes that they can start to be desensitized to the word religion, and they can start seeing religion as a aggregate of, of these practices that can be experienced both inside a traditional religious system or outside a traditional religious system. And we're sort of, as Dr. Graham really, you know, he put it really well, he said we're giving physicians permission to engage with religion in a, in a way that doesn't touch uh, theology in an explicit way. You know, you're not, instead of getting down on your knees and saying, you know, pray with me, it'll help you. Say, well, do you have any form of contemplative practice that you engage in? You know, if yes, then great. If no, then well, I might suggest some. You know, you trying to do that, you know, engage in a contemplative practice. Do you do you have any hope for your condition? Dr. Graham told me a beautiful story about the power of hope. Uh, he had a patient come into him that said, uh, you know, I I have no hope. You know, all is lost. And he said, well, you know, try hoping. And the guy ended up coming back and saying, well, that was the best tool I had through this whole process was this power of hope. And that's a religious category. Uh, so, sorry I took so long. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs>